Let's take our Bibles as we continue in worship this morning and turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter, Galatians chapter five, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 16 this morning. I want to congratulate Andrew and Jenny Lee on the birth of Amelia Grace this past week. Uh, they have a little girl. Of course, Thomas is their, the big brother in the family, and we congratulate them. I also want to remind you that next Sunday morning we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper here together, having communion together, and then moving from here up to the school gym where we'll have our fifth Sunday fellowship. Uh, this is always a great time of food and fellowship together. Uh, the purpose is for us to just connect as a family, but also to be inviting friends and neighbors to come. Uh, we all like free food, so prepare enough for your family and two guests uh, and your favorite dish. And uh, I'm kind of partial toward turnip greens and cornbread, but you bring whatever you want to bring, okay? And we're going to have a great time next Sunday, uh, fellowship, the, the Lord's Supper here, and then moving up to uh, the Fifth Sunday Fellowship in the gym. Uh, also remind you, this Saturday, Dale Howell and Haley, got this is your last week, all right? They'll be getting married this Saturday, and we're excited about Dale and Haley, and it's going to be a wonderful service and ser uh, celebration next Saturday at St. Luke's, St. Mark's, no, Mark's, I'm sorry, St. Mark's, all right. Let's take our Bibles, and we're going to look this morning at verses 13, 14, 15, and, excuse me, 13, 14, and 15. Three verses right in the middle of this fifth chapter. Paul puts them here to bring some, uh, just some clarification and emphasis to what he's been talking about. You know, sometimes people can preach to us, and I loved what Brother KJ said the other night. He said that our lives are changed not by sermons, but by sentences. Now you think about that. Sentences, the words we hear, short thoughts that we can put together. And so Paul puts some, some pretty short but concise and powerful thoughts together in these verses. He says, For you were called, verse 13, you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, that your Holy Spirit would teach us and convict us and encourage us. And Father, help us to see the, the powerful yet simple truths from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul gives us three simple, powerful truths in these verses. You know, sometimes uh, people can talk to us, as I said, and we may not exactly understand what they're saying. Have you ever listened to somebody or heard somebody? One, one of my favorite, and I was reading this week, and I shared some of these with Debbie Duncan the other day, and she didn't get it, so I hope that uh, maybe you will. One of my favorites is Yogi Berra. You remember Yogi Berra? Played with the Yankees, coached with the Mets, a baseball player. But Yogi was famous for what are called Yogiisms. These are statements that he would make. He thought he knew what he was saying, but they, they really made no sense. He, he wrote a book entitled, I Never Said Those Things I Said. Okay? So that kind of sets it up. But uh, here's some things that Yogi said that, you listen. Yogi says, you got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. That's a yogiism. Yogi said, baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. <laughs> Yogi, talking about his daily schedule, said, I usually take a nap. He said, I usually take a two-hour nap from one to four. <laughs> Here's a word of wisdom. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Somebody was talking about a local restaurant. Yogi said, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> they commented to Yogi one day, Yogi, you need a new suitcase. He said, it's okay, I only use it when I travel. 
Here's my favorite yogi, and I'll close. I could go on forever. His, when attendance was going down at the ball game, people weren't coming to watch the Mets play. Yogi responded, if they don't want to come, I can't stop them. If they don't want to come, I can't stop them. So you could listen to Yogi and probably get confused. Well, Paul wants to bring clarity to his message to the church at Galatia. They had become confused. Remember, we said Paul went in preaching the gospel. The church was birthed through the preaching of the gospel. Men and women, boys and girls came to know Christ. And they were running well, Paul said. They had a good beginning. They began in the Spirit. But after they had been going for a while in their Christian faith, some Judaizers, these were Jews from Jerusalem, came and said, yes, you've got a good start. You've been, you believe in Christ, but you must also, in addition to believing in Christ, you must also obey the law, the ceremonial law. In other words, you had to become a Christian and a Jew. They said, well, just look at the law. God gave the law. God gave the law to Moses, Father Abraham. Oh, just look at our tradition. We're God's people. So if you really want to be one of God's people, you must obey God's law. Paul said, well, in essence, what they were doing is that they were nullifying the grace of God. We are saved by grace, by God's grace. God demonstrated His love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That is the, the grace of God. When Christ died on the cross, He died there for sin, for your sin and my sin, all because of the grace of God. And what God expects from us is repentance and faith to turn from our sin and to trust in Christ. So Paul says you were called to freedom. Called to freedom. So he gives us three truths in this passage this morning that I want to remind us. First of all, we are called to liberty. We are called to freedom. We see this in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. So that's what Paul's been trying to communicate to the church, that he wants them to understand the grace of God, that we are saved not by keeping the law, but we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, that means that the work of salvation is complete. There's nothing we can add to or take away from the work of Christ. So, as the church now began to look not only at Christ, but began to enslave themselves or try to obey the law, Paul says, don't do it. Don't do it. You are free in Christ. God has set you free from the law. As we talked about, being enslaved to the law simply means that we are trying to justify ourselves or trying to base our relationship with God on the law. We're living under the law. It's a performance-based religion. A performance-based religion. And there's no freedom in that, is there? There's no freedom in that. Because if, you're ha if you have a performance-based religion, how good do you have to be to get into heaven? That's the age-old question in it. How good? Do you have to ride your bicycle everywhere, knock on doors? Do you have to serve as a missionary? Do you have to do... You, there are many people out there today who are working their way to heaven, they think. And there are a lot of Baptists who say, oh, we, we would condemn people who think they're working their way to heaven. But in our hearts and minds, we're doing the same thing. We think that God loves us because we do certain things. But Paul reminds us God has called us to liberty. A performance-based religion enslaves us rather than sets us free. We're saved by the work of Christ, not by the works of the flesh. Paul told the church at Ephesus, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is a gift? It's something that God gives us. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What we have here in this letter, <clears throat> in Galatians, is people who were actually boasting in the flesh. They were proud of their accomplishments in the flesh. And they were trying to enslave these Christians into the same type of thinking that they were living under, under the law. God loves me because. So Paul says, you have been called to freedom. Chapter 5, verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. 
Now, what is Christian freedom? We've said this many times. I want to make sure you understand. Christian freedom, we are not free to believe anything we want to believe. Like some people would say today. Because see, here's the key. Truth is truth. Truth is truth. And we shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. So it's not freedom to believe anything we want to believe. It's not freedom to live any way we want to live. Some people say, oh, I'm a Christian, so I'll do whatever I want to do. We'll look at that in just a moment. But true freedom is the ability, the power given to us by God to live the way we ought to live. To live in freedom from bondage of the law. To live in freedom from bondage of sin. And to love one another, to serve one another, to love God. There's freedom there. This big piano has been lifted off our shoulders of works. Oh, I don't have to work my way to heaven. I'm just trusting in Jesus. There's freedom. There's freedom. I don't have to be addicted to alcohol. I don't have to run with that crowd. I don't have to be enslaved to the things of the, of the flesh because I am free in Christ. God has set me free. Thank God. He's given me the power to live the way I ought to live. So we're free. Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the bondage of the law, which is self-righteousness. So God has called us to freedom. To freedom. In Christ, we are free to do what we ought to do. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, enables us to walk in obedience to His commands. Can I tell you a secret? We sang it a while ago. We can't do this by ourselves. You can't do it by yourself. So Paul's going to tell us the secret. The secret is the Holy Spirit. Christ in us. And we'll look at that in more in depth in a couple of weeks, but Christ has set us free. Secondly, not only are we called to freedom, now, and again, let me remind you of this calling. Calling. We are called to freedom. We're called by the Holy Spirit. We're called by the preaching of the gospel. We love because He first loved us. So again, just the very fact Paul reminds us that we are called reminds us of God's grace. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God called us out of darkness, Peter says, into His marvelous light. The amazing grace of God. Secondly, we are cautioned against loose living. We are cautioned against loose living. Now, I'm not a slave to alliteration, but I had to come up with an L there. And loose living talks about sin, okay? There's some people today, many people, who think, as they have throughout all the church history, that I'm a Christian, I know I'm saved, and because I'm a Christian, and I know I'm saved, and I know God will forgive me if I ask Him to, then I can live any way I want to live. I can go out and live and just party and do all this, and as long as I confess my sins, then I'm okay. As long as I confess my sin and ask God to forgive me, then everything's okay. See, there's a problem with that. There's a problem. With, does God forgive us? Yes. Are we supposed to confess our sins? Yes. But Christ died to set us free from sin. Not only the presence of sin, but the power of sin, and ultimately the what? Penalty of sin. 